let us get into the topic tonight, which is perhaps the hot button political and economic and probably societal issue in Australia at the moment, and that is housing. And to help us, we have with us here economist Cameron Murray to talk about his new book, The Great Housing Hijack. It's an absolutely excellent read. Um, some joker called Greg Jericho says that Cam Murray unpicks Australia's housing market stitch by stitch and reveals the myths, falsehoods and vested interests that underpin the housing debate. So if you want to believe uh, that person, it's a really good book. Um, Cameron runs his own think tank, Fresh Economic Thinking, and with Paul Freiters uh, wrote Rigged, How Networks of Powerful Mates Rip Off Everyday Australians, which was an update of their excellent 2017 book, Game of Mates, which also just basically looked into the whole rigged nature, as it says, of our housing market. He has been a landlord, boo, a renter, yay, and even worked in property development. Yeah, that's, that's not going to get ready, cheers. But we are very pleased to have him here tonight. He is really one of the foremost experts on housing in Australia. Would you please welcome Cameron Murray. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the Australia Institute. It's great to be here. Now, Cameron, housing is one of those topics. I always think it's a little bit like education where everyone's been to school, so they think they're an expert on, on education. Everyone's either a renter or they own a house, and so they, they kind of think they are an expert on, on the housing market. Your book pushes back on a lot of the tropes, a lot of the, I guess, shibboleths almost in the housing market. One of them I'd like to start with is housing affordability, that you even kind of get, uh, when you read the book, you can almost hear the grinding of the teeth when it comes to it. What is your problem with housing affordability as a term and how it's used in the media? Yeah, housing affordability is one of the three words I'd like to ban. The other two are supply and demand. Um, <laughs> Maybe the economists won't be happy with that, but I say, well, supply and demand just means buyers and sellers. You may as well say the person who wrote the price on the contract determined the price. We want to know why. And it's just the same with affordability. Affordability is a sort of an escape hatch on the question of do we want rents and prices to be lower or do we want them to be higher? And affordability lets us avoid that tough question because the housing crisis is not a crisis for everyone. It's a crisis for buyers and renters. Rising rents and prices are what we call an investment boom for landlords and homeowners. And so by talking about affordability, I think it, it allows us to sidestep what is the core economic issue at stake. So yeah, I, I really don't like that word. If we could proceed for the rest of 2024 onwards and just say we want prices to go down or up, uh, that would be great. I mean, there's, there's a great uh, <laughs> section in your book where you actually quote verbatim a, a question and answer, I think it was Brisbane City, Council, Brisbane City Council, where one of the councillors asked the Lord Mayor, do you think that house prices should go down? That's right. And, and pushed him for 10 minutes. And he does not say yes or no. He, he just says, no, I want affordability of... instead. And Doesn't we, he? And, we, <laughs> yeah. and, we, and I mean, and I'm, I, I say this consciously knowing that I think Last week, I think I wrote an article on housing affordability, <laughs> but very much of the, which you're right, when we talk about housing affordability, we might understand what we're talking, but it is that sort of ability to, to allow politicians to avoid what that really means, and it's that sense of prices actually, is it just they need to fall or do they need to fall relative to something else? Well, that's a good question um, because I think there are two components. You can say, well, um, the cost of buying a house is X percent of Y income. And I credit my colleague Tim Helm with this uh, example. And that's either a problem with the price of house, X, or the income, Y. Um, and you can remedy it by boosting incomes. Because remember, when you go to the auction, you're bidding against the other person and their income, right? And so the, the more even our incomes, the less 
I guess, accentuated those differences in prices are. Because we don't know. I, I tell people in Byron Bay, you know why prices are high there? Because you have to outbid Matt Damon. And now that's true in Sydney as well, right? Didn't he just buy a $100 million harbour front? Well, of course it's high, because you've got to outbid Hollywood as well as the guy next door. Um, so, yeah, so I think affordability sidesteps the question of income distribution and prices or maybe we can access housing without a market price through some other regulated uh, price. So, yeah, don't like the word. Just, I mean, just on that, I, I want to um, get to sort of the politics as well about how it's been used. And there's a really good passage here in, in the book, and I'll just have to take off my glasses, where you talk about how essentially Australian politics has dealt with housing and it's, and it's dealt with it in a really special kind of way that it's guaranteed to get a, a result. It's called an inquiry. And you note that you gave expert testimony to the Felinski inquiry, my goodness, that already feels old, in 2022. And that was an inquiry into housing affordability and supply. And then you go, it replicated many previous inquiries and reports on topics over decades, including the 2003 Prime Ministerial Task Force on Home Ownership, the 2004 Productivity Commission's first Home Ownership Report, the 2008 Senate Select Committee Report on Housing Affordability, various National Housing Supply Council reports from 2008 to 2013, the 2012 Housing Supply and Affordability Reform, always putting in reform means something's going to happen, the 2014 Senate inquiry into affordable housing, and the 2015 parliamentary inquiry into home ownership, to name, and that's to name just a few. Now, what is the, I mean, we know that housing it seems to be an intractable political problem. Is the issue that they don't want to actually make housing actually more affordable, either through stronger wages or stronger incomes or lower housing, or is it because really they're still, as we know from the past, the old sort of line of John Howard, where no one ever came up to him and complained that the price of their house was going up? Is it a case that they really don't want to deal with the problem? Is that your take in your book? Short answer is yes. That's the short answer. But let me just pick up on what you said about the inquiries. That, that quote starts in 2003. But you can go back in time as well. You can go back to the 1911 New South Wales inquiry into rising rents in Sydney that led to the Fair Rents Act of 1915 which did very little because in 1919 there was another federal inquiry, the Piddington Inquiry, into rising rents. Numerous inquiries all the way up to the Second World War and then many afterwards. And in fact, uh, my favourite quote uh, from someone visiting Sydney, uh, when a celebrity visited Sydney, they said, the number of new dwellings recently built is truly astounding. Nevertheless, everyone complains about the high rents and difficulty in procuring a home. Now, that wasn't Taylor Swift, it wasn't Matt Damon, it was Charles Darwin. In January 1836, when the population of New South Wales was 20,000 people. So this is the normal outcome of markets. We've seen it for 200 years. We've had inquiries for more than 100 years. And if you look at that history, you have to think, well, maybe we, we like it that way. And I actually, I don't know if you've got time. Should we do some audience participation? Yeah, go for it. What I like to do is just think about the, um, the politics of housing. And I want to see if this room is representative of the country. So I, I don't know if you are warned. This is a participatory politics in the pub. I want to see hands up all the homeowners in the audience. Nice and high, nice and high. Now, keep them up if in 2024 you're having the worst housing crisis of your lifetime. Otherwise, just put them down. OK. Great. We've got a couple still. OK, put them down. Now, the renters, I want you to put your hands up. And I want you to keep them up if you're having the worst housing crisis of your lifetime. Otherwise, just put them down. So this is the thing. We now have nine people who are having a housing crisis and about 60 who are having a great uh, period of time in terms of returns on their balance sheet from their house prices. And I think that is the heart of the problem, is we have two-thirds of households are homeowners, 18% of households are landlords, 
And electorally, high prices wins. And the crisis is really just this small sliver. Right? We have 30% of households who are private renters, and only about half of them or less, 10 or 15%, are really having a crisis. Now, unfortunately, I just don't think that sells politically. What works politically is pretending to look after those 10% while actually looking after the 70 plus is, yeah. Do you think that's going to change at all as you know, we hear younger people are struggling to get into the housing market and, we, and the data was suggesting that uh, for the first time we had under a majority of, or a majority of people in their early 30s were not homeowners. Is that something that you think is going to be, it's just going to force it to become a political issue? Yeah, um, I think we're a long way off changing that total balance in the electorate. But I, the way I see the electoral pressure coming is more indirect. Because of the large inequalities with age, I think it's that intra-family concern of, oh, well, you know, our family is entrenched in this area, but my kids and grandkids don't live anywhere near me. And so you can, that 10% of households, that... 30 or 50 percent of renters can have a disproportionate political pressure um, during certain periods in the market cycle, which I think they're having now. So I do think there are indirect feedback mechanisms. Of course, we have to reflect that for most of the 2010s, rents were falling in Brisbane and Adelaide, and since between 2017 and 2022, were falling in Melbourne and Sydney as well. And so we've got to strike while the iron's hot, I think and make some changes now because the next part of the cycle we might forget about it and then we'll have this next boom and we'll be like oh weren't we going to do something about that <laughs> back in 2024 <laughs> i mean and this was something i was writing about that actually you know you kind of look back to where prices were in 2020 where in 2020 everyone was going oh my god we got this massive housing crisis and now those prices look pretty good you know and you're right, it's this case of it's, you hold another inquiry and by the time the inquiry is reported, you're oh. almost weird. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I note in the book, the, the inquiry cycle lags the property cycle <laughs> and the policy cycle lags the inquiry cycle. So we're always doing things many years too late. We're trying to decrease rents once they're already falling. We're trying to stop them rising when they're actually falling. Like we're, we're very out of sync. Um, and so I think... If we're going to make policy change, we need to understand that there is a cycle and that it's not going to be a perfect fit at all points in time. And so when we think about things like rent control or limits on how quick rents can increase, well, had we had that in most cities for the 20 it wouldn't have actually affected rents very mm. much because they weren't rising. It would have affected rents in 2023 when they rose fast. And so that 2023, let's say it's a 30% increase, would have had to have been spread out over three years instead of one year. And that would have been really useful. But of course, that wasn't on the political agenda in the 2010s. Because yeah, we were in a different part of the cycle. It wasn't a problem, cycle. yeah. Exactly. It's, it's a little bit, um, and I know you sort of, uh, you do address negative gearing and, and perhaps suggest it's, it's actually perhaps not as big an issue as, as is often stated. But, you know, like, right, the most recent tax figures suggest that actually there's not much negative gearing going on. But that's not because there isn't a lot of renting or landlords. It's because interest rates are so damn low, it's almost impossible to negative gear. But in a couple of years, we'll have a record number of negative gearers in the figures because interest rates will go up. So I just... I think what you were saying about renting and all that, and you really, throughout the book, it's, it's quite wonderful, Cameron, you push back on a lot of these um, stated wisdoms, perhaps, and one of them, as you mentioned there, rental price caps, or which we see many economists say, oh, no, this will distort the market, it's terrible. Yeah. And we at the Australian Institute have said, well, we actually, it, there's nothing spectacular about rents that uh, is going to destroy the market if we have price caps. We have price caps on other things. What is your take on all that argument that, oh, this will ruin supply or it will, you know? Yeah, so uh, there's probably two ways to respond. Wow, that sun is just blasting in right now. I'm just going to slide back. There we go. Uh, two responses. Firstly, home ownership 
is rent control. Because you pay one price today, and then if the market moves, you don't have to keep paying the market price, you just paid one price. Your landlord fixes the rent forever for you, right? And so if you're arguing that rent control is inefficient, well, so is home ownership. Now, a lot of people who really study urban economics understand this argument. Most economists don't. The second point about, when I say rent control, just limiting the rate at which you can put the rent up on a sitting tenant and limiting the number of reasons you can remove a sitting tenant. It's not rocket science. Many, many countries have had it for many, many decades. But I, I, I think the political sales pitch for it is this. In Queensland and New South Wales, property investors pay land tax on their land value. But they don't like when their land values go up and their land tax obligation doubles one year because the land price has doubled. They like that to be smoothed out. So we actually average their last three years land value to work out their land tax. So if your land value as an investor goes from a million in the last few years and it jumps up to two million, your land tax goes up by one third, not by 100%, because we average that two with the previous ones. And we spread out that 100% increase over three or more years. So my argument is, well, if it's good enough for investors, <laughs> isn't it good enough also for tenants? Because they don't, you know, it's a much larger share of their income. Yeah. Shouldn't we help them smooth those unexpected changes in expenses? I think it's fair. And you also point out in your book, in your time as a landlord, that you know, you'd kept rent at a certain rate for a real long time and then it almost got to the point you almost just thought, I should raise it. There was no actual reason really to, to raise rent. Yeah, so you hear a lot from the property industry, oh, landlords are in trouble, landlords are in trouble. Well, actually most landlords bought their houses years ago. Only the very, very few landlords paid last year's price and borrowed against it and paid the current interest rate. Most landlords have owned their homes for decades. So it's not a, it's not a cash flow issue. And yeah, I, I was a renter and a landlord at the same time, a rent vesta, <laughs> what they call it. And you know, my rent's going up and I'm just like, well, I've got this really reliable tenant. I, can't, I don't want to get rid of it. It's too much hassle. But then at some point you're like, I should just do it. Like, it feels there's this, like, cultural pressure. Am I being silly, just letting this... <laughs> shouldn't I do something? And then I, I kind of had to make an excuse. Oh, well, sorry. Oh, the rent's got to go up because reasons. Of course, it didn't have to. Nothing changed. I just felt in this awkward position that, well, my rent's going up. I should be fair and put your rent up. <laughs> <laughs> some of the... Let's get to some of the other... And we will be having questions from the audience. Um, but uh, let's go to some of the supposed solutions and to this housing crisis, and which, I mean, you, you have been saying, you know, we're talking a small segment, but you're not denying that there is actually an issue with housing and that it is a crisis. Yeah, so I think yeah. that's... But that's... Understanding what the crisis is, I think, helps you with the solution. Because yeah. if you think everyone's in a crisis, then you're going to say, well, we need to make all the homes worth less. But that's pol picking a political fight with most households unnecessarily. Yeah. Right? Oh, I'm going to orchestrate a collapse in housing asset values. Oh, okay, well, um, <laughs> that sounds like a financial crisis to me. Um, how about we diagnose the problem first? Oh, okay, we've got this 10% of households. Their problem is, one, rents are rising quickly, but their incomes are rising, you know, not evenly, yeah. so people in your, you know, reason your rent's going up in your location is because other people are coming there, right, and spending on it. Um, so if you diagnose it correctly, I think you can think about, well, well, let's smooth out the rents and then let's offer this an alternative to, yeah. out of the market. So The big one we always hear is density. We need to improve density, more medium density, more high density, high density, closer to the CBD, that's what's needed. In your book, you go, yeah, nah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, the problem, I think, is it's very easy to get confused and see density and quantity as the same. But density, you know, the engineers in the audience will know, you need to have a unit of measurement. Density is dwellings per land area on a specific spot. Supply or number of dwellings is a quantity, a quantity per period of time. Right? How many new dwellings are we adding? You can have really fast supply at low density and really slow supply at high density. And just most people confuse this. And so they think, oh yeah, if you can build 100 um, dwellings on this site, therefore that's a 100 
extra this year or this period, but it's not. It's just 100 on that site over a number of years that is optimal for the property owners. And, you know, I, I think it's 2024, so a lot of town plans need to be modernised and updated. I'm totally with it. And there's many um, urban design reasons to have more density, but making housing cheaper is not one of them. Um, density and supply are not the same, and nobody's going to flood the market and panic build buildings just because they're allowed to. In most cities, there is an enormous stock of feasible new development that is not taken up because it pays more to wait and build in the future than build today. And so there's this intertemporal trade-off. Well, I could build more today, but if I flood the market today, I make less money. So I have to actually drip feed across that portfolio of feasible sites to make the highest, what we call in economics, present value, make the highest return on those sites. And so, yeah, there's a built-in speed limit. Density is good for urban design reasons in many cases. One missing part of that debate is those property rights to build more density have a market price. And so it's not free to do this because you could charge property owners, right? You could sell those property rights to them as any free market economist should want to do. You want more density? You can come and buy them at an auction from me, the government who regulates density. ACT does this quite well in terms of capturing that, but we miss that argument that this is not a free policy, it's got a cost, and secondly, it's not a housing affordability policy or a make housing cheaper policy, it's an urban design or urban shape policy, which is fine, we should do that for urban shape reasons, not for, urban, not for housing price reasons. Okay, let's go to one of the, the, the big housing debate of last year was over the half which I've now completely forgot what it even stands for. What Housing, housing afford Affordable oh, no, Future affordable. Fund. Uh, uh. Housing Affordability. Anyone future remember? Fund. Huh? Housing Future Fund. Oh, it was a future fund. God. I, I have been watching Utopia on, on Netflix and, uh, it, yeah. Huge bun fight. Labor accusing the Greens of, of selling out, um, you know, they, they walked away from wanting to help housing. The Greens were saying it did nothing. The Liberals, I can't even remember what they were doing, if they were doing anything. You actually mentioned about the half. Give us your rundown on the half and, and is it good, bad, or it doesn't really matter? The half is just the most bizarre piece of financial engineering and I, it confuses me no end. For starters, there's $10 billion in the fund, right? Where did the 10 billion come from? If we have 10 billion dollars, build some houses with it. If we don't have 10 billion, you can't just go and buy BHP shares and Apple shares with it. You either have the money or you don't have the money. No one asks where we're gonna get the money for the future fund. It's just this magic thing. Secondly, houses are assets, right? Everyone at Treasury, I call it the magic suit. I don't know if anyone's reads my website, go on, your <laughs> fresheconomicthinking.com. The Treasury officials, they put their suit on, they go to work. Houses, they're so expensive. We're going to have to spend billions. Oh, got to, can't do that. Too expensive. They go home, take their suit off, get on the phone to their mortgage broker. <laughs> Can I have a million bucks? I really want to build a house. It's the best investment. A house in Sydney, nothing beats it. Which is it? Is it a huge expense or the best investment you can buy with your money? It can't be both. And so the half basically tries to have it both ways. It says housing is a really, really high cost, but also in the half, we'll buy shares in build to rent property, we'll buy shares of the company that owns houses, but we won't buy houses. Why? If you look at, for example, the balance sheets of, um, let's do the Land and Housing Corporation in New South Wales, they have to value all their property assets, all their public housing assets. And in 2012, those properties were worth $32 billion. And in 2017, they were worth $54 billion. It's a 7.1% compound return on a fund that owns housing for the future of those occupants. Why don't we just build houses and call it a fund? Why do we have to first buy BHP shares or whatever 
before we build the houses. Now, I can accept that maybe there was some really smart people in the Labor Party who knew that construction was constrained, so we couldn't just do that in 2023. But of course, planning for building houses in 2023 doesn't mean building them in 2023. You could have been starting them this year when construction's coming off. It would have been perfect timing to plan a huge construction program for when, in the second half of 2024, private housing construction has come off. But no, we're still just allocating money, paying fund managers a cut of 10 billion. You know, 1% of 10 billion is 100 million every year. So if you're paying a, a management fee for a fund, that's tens if not 100 million dollars just down the drain because you can't accept that houses are also assets unless you take your suit off and go home. I think this is a, a really good, and this is a good intro into where I want to talk to you about your, I guess, your your main solution. But it really conforms with, you know, I think some of you might have been here when Richard Dennis has, has sort of said about the solution is, you know, if, if people need housing, the government should build housing and give it to or sell it to them or rent it to them. It's um, It's a fairly obvious solution that we... Uh, seem to never want to to actually approach, and, and it it is a, a little bit like you know with climate change, where it's oh we'll let the market something we can't interfere with the market, and yet we look at well we haven't been interfering really in the market in a direct way for as you say a hundred years, and we're where we are um, with the, with the uh, I guess the interactions of the government in the market where it tries to affect the market is most notably in, in the tax system and in first home owner grants. Yeah. And I notice in your book you're, you're not all that critical of the capital gains discount on a housing policy front. Mm -hmm. You're more, and this is certainly something we've been pushing, is that it's just terrible for equality because basically 80% of the benefit of the capital gains discount goes to the richest 10%. 80 into 10 is generally not good for equality. Um, but what is you, and you know this? Is, but these policies are often criticised that it's stoking demand. That that's all it's doing. What's your your pushback on on that? The first homeowners grant stoking. Yeah, demand first homeowners grant. The negative the gearing. All the, that are all, always the government seems to be just trying to. Yeah. You know, the solution is, oh, we'll give more money to people to yeah. buy houses. It's like you're just stoking demand. So I think that's a problem diagnosis issue, right? And I think that politically is, well, it's not a housing crisis because everyone who's bought their home, they want to go up in value. That's great. Um, we're going to address the problem of people trying to buy a home today. So if we only have to subsidise those people, then we think we've fixed the problem. Okay, fine. Um, I don't, I don't have a sh strong view against doing that. Um, the current two major parties are proposing a shared equity scheme along that line. That's Labor's thing. They'll take, they'll, <laughs> again, this is the housing, houses are assets. They're like, oh, we'll buy 30% ownership of your home and that'll be all off book because that's a good asset to invest in. What about 100% of my house? Can you buy that, put off book? It's the same. 30% of 3.3 houses or 100% of one house is still the same exposure to the housing market. So that's Labor's policy and this, I think the Liberals are now doing super for housing or something. Mm. And the criticism of both of those is that it's stoking demand. So it's true that that will bring some marginal first home buyers off the sideline. I think making sure this doesn't um, have a large price effect involves making sure there is an opportunity cost, making sure it's, there's a cost to the buyer of using that scheme. So first homeowner grants, if you didn't buy, it didn't cost you anything. If you bought, you got free money. Of course you're going to buy. Super for housing, if you don't buy, you keep the money in super, you make a return, maybe you buy next year or the year after, after you've made a 20% return on your savings. So there is a cost of trying to just jump in and bid up the price. So I think the, the current schemes are better than just cash grants because they come with a cost. And secondly, the price effects aren't going to be permanent, right? Because as I like to say, asset prices can't just go up because. They have to go up for a reason. Because anyone who spends a dollar on a housing asset can buy any other asset in the economy. And if houses go up, 
and the yield, the rate of return we get goes down, well, people go, I don't want to put my dollar in that, I'll put it somewhere else. So yeah, there might be a temporary adjustment, but if you had those policies stick around for a decade, all the prices would smooth off again. What about the sense that um, governments, uh, and this is the line certainly the Greens have been pushing that, and I think even David Pocock has been pushing that, in a sense, we're, we're making it easier to buy your second house than your first house in, in the... Yeah, look, I think some of that argument is a little bit overblown because for your first house, you get 100% of your capital gains tax-free. Um, and so that's very, very good. <laughs> And the income from your rent, the non-financial income of not having to pay rent, is also not uh, a taxable income. So yeah, we advantage home ownership quite a lot relative to buying, uh, investing. And we could skew that more with first homeowners grants, and we could skew that more by reducing the capital gains tax discount. Um, and maybe you'll get a small effect. You can skew it more by allowing interest on your own mortgage to be tax deductible, like happens in the Netherlands and the United States. That's another trade-off. What happens politically, though, when you've got these um, tax or policy changes that, that pit homeowners against landlords, is the landlords get together and say, oh, there's not going to be enough rentals because we're <laughs> going to get out of the market. Every, every benefit you give to a homeowner, you've got to give to us again. And of course, that that skews that balance back. And so you're in this never-ending fight of who we're going to give the more tax breaks and grants to, the investors or the homeowners. And we end up at this political stalemate, I think, where we are. It's always wonderful. I always love the argument uh, whenever it's about negative gearing or whatever, that oh, that'll mean, oh, we're going to ruin supply of rents because landlords will sell their houses because they're no longer viable. And I always love what... Who did they sell them to? Uh, <laughs> this is a great one because, actually, if we, if we go back in time, if we go prior to the Second World War in Australia and we look at the capital cities, we had home ownership at something like 44 or 45%. And in 1971, we had it at 71.6%. So we got a quarter of households out of renting and into home ownership in the 20 post-war years. And one of the ingredients in that was the wartime rent controls made being a landlord a bad investment dollar for dollar compared to other things in the economy. And when all the landlords try to sell at once, the only people to soak up those houses are homeowners, right? And so, yeah, of course, that's, that's the balance, you know? If, if a home's not owned by a landlord, it's owned by a homeowner. So if they all sell, that's how you get higher home ownership. There's no other way to increase home ownership apart from making landlords sell homes. There is just, it's physically not possible. So, yeah, I find it a kind of bizarre thing, and I, I think the appropriate response to that is say, well, you've just shown us the one way to get higher home ownership, and so thank you for demonstrating that. Um, let's push a little harder. Um, if anyone uh, would like to ask a question, if you uh, come up to the microphone and uh, just in a nice orderly um, manner. That'd be quite nice. Uh, anyone who's got any questions about housing, how to fix it, what they think might be the solution, and see if Cameron has, has got some ideas on it. I want to get to your big, I think, solution in, in your book. And it, and it has a wonderful quote that, again, has lovely resonance with something Richard Dennis says about Norway, but you're saying about Singapore, and that is, there is a place called Singapore. It does exist. They do things differently there and they work, why wouldn't we do that? And this leads into your wonderfully Scott Morrison named uh, program called Housemate, <laughs> which was devised at the time you were writing, there was all the home builder and job, job seeker, seeker and job, builder, keeper, job keeper, all of that. So what is Housemate and I guess more to the point, what's Singapore doing that we should be doing? Right. Uh, they basically give everyone the option to buy a cheap home from the government. That's the op. That's what they do. And Singapore is interesting because um, after independence, in the early 1960s, home ownership was 20%. A lot of slums, and the government just said, we've got to fix this. There were a lot of fires and other issues, and they just started building homes. Now, admittedly, there was quite an authoritarian strong hand there, but they got home ownership up from 20% in 1960 to 88% at the end of the 1980s by giving everyone 
over the age of 21 the right to buy a discounted dwelling from the government. And the government just started building homes. Now, initially, they weren't very good. They are actually terrible. Six-storey, commie block style, external um, balconies, but they were designed for the cross ventilation because it's very hot. Nowadays, they're some of the best homes in, in the region. Uh, if you compare Hong Kong to Singapore in housing, for example, Singapore blows it out of the water in terms of um, size and quality of dwelling space per person and price. And I, you know, in my first book, Rigged or Game of Mates, the, the, the approach there was just look around at the world's best thing and ask why aren't we doing that? And so I took that approach in housing and I looked everywhere. I looked in Europe, I looked in Asia, I looked in everywhere I could historically and I just, the only thing that seemed to work to get people cheap housing was to give them cheap housing as directly as possible. Now, whether that's in the European social housing sectors, for example, Helsinki's 200,000 social housing dwellings, or Vienna's, or the Netherlands, five million, or whatever the number is, some many millions in their social housing regulated sector, or Singapore's public home ownership sector. And the home ownership idea resonated for a few reasons for me. One, culturally, and you'll see in the book, one of my favourite films, The Castle, Daryl Kerrigan, I think he'd be proud of having his own home if he bought it from the government for a discount and he'd have, you know, a good antenna and he'd have all the accessories. Um, and secondly, it's just administratively simpler. Every time, whether it's the public owning rental home or a landlord, there's a conflict between the occupant and the landlord in terms of, oh, I want to paint the house but you'll have to pay a higher rent. Oh, well, I'm happy living in a house that's not painted and paying a lower rent. Bad luck, you can leave. There's always a conflict in incentives between the occupant and the landlord. So why don't you just make the occupant and the landlord the same person? I mean, if you're willing to subsidise their rent for the rest of their life, why don't you just sell them the present value of the subsidised rent, the home, and let them manage it? And then when they're retired, they can, you know, not paint it or not fix it. When they've got kids, they can fix things up. And uh, so that's basically my logic. And, and so once you become active in that market, many things become possible. So there are people in Singapore who don't own their home. Uh, there are many elderly poor. And because you're in the business of building 20 or 30,000 dwellings a year and managing a stock, you can offer in the seniors rental scheme a $9,000 rent for 10 years for 10 years, $900 a year for the seniors rental program. So if you don't own a house and you're a senior, you show up and go, yeah, I'll take one of them. $9,000 for 10 years. It makes things possible. And people say, people say to me, that's crazy, that's student politics. You're not just going to go around to every suburb and just start building houses or buying them or you know, getting private developers to tender projects and just letting anyone who doesn't have a house buy a house. And I say, well, imagine going back in time before public schools and some crazy guy got on stage in Canberra with Greg Jericho's ancestors and said, I reckon we just build schools wherever people are and just pay for teachers and let everyone send their kids there. And that, you would say, well, that's student politics, that's impossible. And then we did it and we love it. And we lobby for more teachers and better pay and better schools. And we do it with public hospitals. Put them everywhere. Now we argue we've got to train more nurses, we've got to do more of this. And I, we do it with roads, right? It's uncontroversial that we should build more roads and it just should be done and we have high expectations. Oh, there's potholes. We complain about it and we expect it to be done. Imagine if it was the same with housing. So I, I think it's totally reasonable. We can build the roads, we can build everything to the front fence. It's not impossible to go past the front fence and do the easy part as well. I really like that idea, but everyone else. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so, just, thank you. Just let me be clear. It, it's not going to solve the rents tomorrow, and it's going to be difficult. And the last first time we tried public housing after the soldier housing after the First World War, mm, I think terrible. it was the Victorian governor basically got his brother to be in charge, who overpaid for land from his cousin, and yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, teething problems there, but. Over, over the next decade or 15 years, if we can build up that 10 or 15%, because remember the housing crisis is that 10 or 15%, so every renter has that option when they're young to jump in, then the next time there's a rental crisis, 
Everyone has that option. And there's a huge share of the population who are in it. It doesn't have to be everyone. It doesn't mean I'm going to, I hate markets and I want to get rid of all the private dwellings. I just want to build 10 or 15%, give anyone the option, universal, and let all the other people do whatever they want with houses. Because you've got that escape valve from the market. So with this, would you, you know, would it be houses and apartments or how would you... It would just literally it? be whatever is suitable for the suburbs that it exists. So in, in the cities, it'll be towers. In the suburbs, townhouses. In the fringes, you can just give people plots of land and houses. Um, there's going to be a few economic tricks to it. One of those is making sure the spatial gradient is matched with the market because otherwise everyone will queue up for a, ho a housemate house on Bondi Beach. Yep. So you've got to sell them at a premium, uh, the same premium that exists. So if there's a million dollar house in the western suburbs and two million in Sydney, well, your public housing is going to be at least a million still in Bondi. Yep. And in Singapore, you can buy a public housing dwelling for $700,000, five bedroom executive suite from the public housing provider. Yeah, you can do that, and some people do. Or you can buy a studio for 90000 So I guess it's getting away from that sense that oh, all public housing is, is almost just for low-income housing. It's not, it's not about low-income housing. It's about actually the government being, actually being a developer, being in the market and providing supply that is needed where it's... I call it like yeah. a parallel system. Just like we have public schools, if you, if you lose your job and your kids are in private school, you can send them to the public school. They still get school. Same with housing, right? Um, so I, I think it's a parallel system. You want it to be universal. So any, even people who own their own property go, oh, yeah, well, at least my kids can buy into that. You know, maybe they won't be able to afford here, but they can buy into that. And it might take a couple of years um, to, to get on the list. There's a bit of a waiting list always. But... You know, better than today, where they're subject to these rental fluctuations and, you know, in certain areas, buying in in the capital cities is, is crazy. And the earlier you get into this, the, the more rent you save over your lifetime. So I think it's great. And that'd be able to sell, sell, sell it and... So my proposal yeah. is you can resell to anyone who qualifies, who doesn't own property. So you've got to eliminate everyone who owns property, you're fine. If you want to sell it, you can come and get one, but you can't buy a second dwelling. Yep. And you, in Singapore, you have to occupy it for five years. And so that's to discourage churn and say, oh, I'm getting a freebie, I'm going to move in and then rent it out. Uh, so yeah, you can resell to anyone who qualifies. And that keeps the prices down in the parallel market because everyone who qualifies can also just go and buy a brand new one at a third of the market price. So they're not going to pay you the market price because all your buyers have that outside option. So that anchors the price. It's a little bit like how interest rates work. You know, the Reserve Bank makes interest rates go down because they create this option at the central bank. So anyone can always swap at that interest rate. And that's what we do for housing. Oh, yes. Oh. Sorry, I didn't even see yes, you there. Sorry, I was, Sorry, the lights were blinding me. So yes, thank you. Just just come up. Right come right up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just have a question. So Cam, Cameron mentioned it before about what we're talking about is not going to solve the immediate housing crisis, which I totally get. But just going back to your little um, renter landlord situation that you talked about earlier, you said that, and this has been, always been my thinking, like most landlords didn't buy their house last year and have current interest rates. So why did all the rents go up? Well, why did all the landlords put the rents up? Good question. Thank you. Um, which chapter is that, Greg? Why rents go up? Um, rents go up because incomes go up, is the short answer. So what we're seeing right now is a combination of rising nominal household incomes since COVID, uh, a little bit of the, inf uh, the, the high immigration push, which is somewhat temporary because everyone has to funnel through that market. Uh, through the rental market, but predominantly it's the rising nominal income. So if you look at some of the Reserve Bank research, the bottom 20% of households saw their incomes increase more than 15%, I think it was 2022 or 2023, and households with mixed income, so that's like contractors, plumbers, self-employed people, saw their income skyrocket. And of course they're going to go and move to a better house, better location, buy a house. Um, and so what's happened since COVID is 
incomes have risen, but in a very uneven and unexpected way, I think. And that's why there's the, oh, why, why do I, who are these people showing up in my suburb who've got these pay rises? I didn't get them. Well, a lot of businesses and self-employed people did make more money. There's one business owner that didn't. Um, <laughs> but I'm now employed by council, so, you know. Um, Cameron, I totally agree with the, the notion, I suppose it's still only a notion, that our government actually provides social housing. Um, but I'm also, you know, working in the planning development sort of field mm -hmm. and have a very strong sense that our, our certainly our New South Wales government, because um, that's where I'm working, focus on dwellings, number of dwellings, is misplaced, that we should be instead focusing on size of housing in areas because so many people are building 300 square metre houses on 400 square metre lots or vice versa, where a 300 square metre house could really easily, without increasing what is apparent density, whole, you know, have three couples or a couple and small children even. Um, and so I'm fairly of the opinion that we should actually be changing lobbying for change in the um, planning system as well, to, to not focus on number of dwellings, so you can only have a main dwelling and a secondary or a dual occupancy, but however many dwellings you can actually fit into 300 square metres mm. or whatever that would normally be a single dwelling. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think there are many, so a lot of councils have updated for dual occupancy, like two dwellings on one site with minimum standards or granny flats. Um, but I don't think dense, this is, it's almost another density argument, right? We should have more dwellings on this site. But I don't think density is constraining how many homes, because everyone who would, you know, those six, three couples who would live in that house wouldn't buy the next house or rent the next house. So their sort of um, purchasing power is being redirected there. Whereas had they bought the next house, maybe that one would exist instead. So I, you know, there are reasons there are minimum standards on dwellings. If you go back, anyone who wants to be entertained for a while can go online to the Trove or the National Library and find all these archive reports of what Australia was like before we had town planning and minimum construction standards. And, uh, you know, there's reasons they exist, but it's 2024. So yeah, of course we can change them, but I don't think it will change the price very much. Sorry, I'm not actually suggesting we reduce the construction standards. I'm suggesting that you can have a 300 square metre house. You could have 10 people in a family living in that. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to say it's based on number of dwellings as opposed to size of house? We What's can, based on that? Sorry. Uh, so an RU2 zone, sorry, mm -hmm. an R2 zone, um, can have a dwelling or mm -hmm. a dual occupancy if it meets a certain size of block. But it can have, there's no limit to the size of the house. And there's no limit yeah. to the number of people in that house. But there's a limit to the number of dwellings. So if that one block with one yeah. building on it could actually have three or four yeah. separate. I see um, what you're saying. So this is an argument a lot of people make. We should be, allow smaller dwellings. A bit like Japan. Have you heard of the Tokyo's yeah, yeah. got a bunch? Yeah, I don't think we want to go quite that. Small. But no. I mean, you, you're saying for 300 square meters, you could have one house, or you could have three 100 square meter dwellings yeah. and to three couples. But of course, the six people can share that house as well. Yeah. And that would be equivalent. So right. I just don't think there's a, a strong constraint there on on the number of houses. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. We can talk. Uh, anyway, we might have to talk Let's about talk this afterwards. after because we do have more people here. Yes. Sir. Yeah, hi, this is probably the complete opposite end oh. of the spectrum. Um, <laughs> so housing is a human right, not a commodity. Discuss. <laughs> um, I think what I would say is that access to a location is probably a right. It is not... Oh, thanks, Em. I'll sort you out later. <laughs> the reason prices are high is not because of houses. I mean, I could go and park a caravan here and be dirt cheap. It's just the location I'm not allowed to access. I could park it at Bondi Beach and it would be the same price 
but it's the right to the location that is expensive. And this is the sort of um, Georgist argument, that it's the land that is the problem. And so if you want to think about, oh, there's a right to housing, I think, well, there's a right to reside somewhere on the planet um, that's not in the middle of the sticks without having to pay someone else who drew a line around this lot before you were born. Um, and I, I have an <laughs> I'll just tell you what's in the book. Um, I have this story about imagine being James Cook and going to this island and, and sort of trying to explain before there was property rights, oh, no, I give you this, this gold and these clothes and there are these invisible lines around your island. They're just invisible. Um, but after I give you this, if you come in here, I can just kill you. You know, imagine trying to explain the idea of property rights if you've never had it. You'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. What are these invisible lines and why can't I go there? So I think if we're, we want to talk about housing, obviously in the book I talk about property rights a lot and I'm going, that, there's your problem. Housemate deals with that because it says, well, you can get property rights anytime you want, come and get them. And you know, the benchmark there is the land is free, you just pay the construction cost, kind of. And that's sort of how it links together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. It does, and that sounds awesome. Thank you. Great. Oh, great question. Hi. Um, I'm, you, you position housing as an asset, and the government's mm -hmm. place is uh, provision of housing as an asset, and then you liken it to schools. But we don't own schools as assets. We use it like a service. The government owns the schools, and they are assets. Mm -hmm. But it's more of a service. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm trying to think of other parallels here, and I'm thinking about transport, mm -hmm. education as a service, transport as a service, mm -hmm. housing as a service. Mm -hmm. Why have you focused on housing, provision of housing, the, the answer, the solution is provision of that housing as an asset instead of provision of housing as a service? And this relates to the previous gentleman's question. I'm thinking about basic services, mm -hmm. universal basic services. Mm -hmm. Why do we, why, why can't it be possible that we use housing the way that we use public transport as a service or mm -hmm. public, like, yeah. Why, why does it have to be the ownership thing? Why is it an asset thing? Why have we moved away from renting? Why do we not trust government to provide housing as a service instead of skipping that and going straight to housing as an mm -hmm. asset? Uh, I think I see what you mean. Uh, I've got sort of two responses. Firstly, if you paid for a stream of services in an upfront lump sum amount, wouldn't that also be an asset? Do you think our public buses are? Of course, because you can privatise bus routes, and we have no, but private the person buses. That uses the buses. Of course, but own the them. person who uses the, owns the house will use it for their lifetime and their children's lifetime. It's not like they don't get the service; they just happen to own it and don't have to bargain with someone else who does every time they want to change the kitchen or paint it or you know, have other occupants. So I think it's just, a, for me, it's just an administrative thing. Like schools, there are many schools. So we do public-private partnerships for schools in Queensland, right? We have Stockland own a school and we rent the service off them. Why don't we do it, you know, why don't we own it and rent it at once, just like housing, right? So, um, yeah, for me, that's, um, the, there is an equivalence. Um, what, sorry, you started saying something else and I thought it was really good and then I forgot. Transport as a service. service. yeah. Housing as a service. School education yeah, as yeah. a service. They're all services, service but... Provider, the not an asset pr provider. That's where the... the yeah. I th I, I'm an economist. I apologise. But <laughs> there is an equivalence. We can turn any stream of services into an asset by creating a right to it. And you can either pay once or you can pay every year or you can get it for free every year or pay for it up front. Um, so for me, there's an equivalence, and it's a, just an administrative simplicity. I'm fine. If you want to build lots of houses and rent them cheap, do it. But then you have to manage that relationship rather than just go, oh, you're going to rent it 50% forever? How about I just sell it to you 50% today? And then you deal with those. So for me, it's an administrative thing and also a little bit of a cultural and political thing so that Daryl Kerrigan would be like, yeah, yeah, house proud owner of that, even though it's a discounted present value of a subsidised time. Does that help? We can talk about that as well. Um, sorry, this is going to have to be the last question. I'm sorry about that. We've just hit our eight, 
uh, 7.30, Mark, so this will have to be it. Sorry. But um, Cameron will, will be, be around. Here. We'll I'll, be here. I'll be up there yeah. where the yeah. books are, signing yeah. books and talking about well, housing okay. for hours. Um, it's a big question in a way. So I don't know. Um, um, thanks for tackling a really important topic. Um, just in terms of the building industry itself, I think it's fair to say that building high-density uh, accommodation is a much more challenging um, prospect than building... Uh, single dwellings or you know medium density. Mm -hmm. um, we had the Share Girl Weir report uh, several years ago. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the Mascot Towers and the mm -hmm. Opal Towers. Um, what sort of protections need to be built in for a whole new set of buyers that uh, may end up with a disaster on their hands with some of the very poor quality development that's happening across this nation and across the world? That is a very good, tough <laughs> question. <laughs> Finish on. Um, so we tried, we've tried many times to address building quality issues and warranties for builders for certain periods of time. The problem is buildings last longer than companies that build them. And so you can't require someone or an org company, a non-human, to be liable for something. And even a human, you know, an old guy builds a house, he's carked it, he's, all the houses he built fell down. What are you meant to do? So I think the the way we get around that is we have minimum standards, we have inspections and oversight, and we have to socially ensure this industry in some way. Um, I think that's the, the answer. Yeah, housemate, I mean, it's a risk in the private sector, it's a risk in the public sector. And if we're going to pay to remedy private sector dwellings, which we might end up doing, well, I'm fine to pay to remedy if we stuff up a few public sector ones too. I, I just don't... You know, when you think about a housemate and you think about Singapore, yes, every single building there is a tower. In Australia, most houses are not. They're mostly detached. So if you have a public home ownership program where dwellings are spread through the major cities and towns, roughly evenly, like public schools, then they're also going to be mostly detached houses and townhouses. And only in the major capitals in inner areas will there be high-rises. So it's not going to be a... You know, when I say Singapore, I mean the economic design, not the physical design of, of the homes. And on that note, we shall end. Could you please thank Cameron Murray for being tonight? Thank you. Cameron will be available at the back. Uh, there are copies of the book you're able to buy and, and Cameron is there to sign and talk about everything that's wrong with housing and how to fix it in one minute while he's signing your book. Could you please also thank uh, Verity Lane Markets for this? And once again, um, we do really enjoy holding these. Um, they are free. Unfortunately, they're not free for us. So, if, again, if you are able to become a contributor to Australia Institute, it's very grateful and helps us to keep holding these great events. Um, Cameron and I will actually be holding a webinar next Thursday, it is, I think Thursday, yes, can't be Friday because that's Good Friday, so Thursday, uh, I think it's at 11 o'clock, so if you would like to listen in on that where we might delve into a few other more meaty things, uh, you can go to our website and register there. Um, and don't forget to sign up as well on our website to get on the list to get notified of the Politics in the Pubs events. The next one is being held on the 4th of April, which will feature um, a book launch of uh, Bray Lee's stunning debut novel about art, money and power, which is a really good combination of topics, called The Work. So. Um, once again, go on the website to see about that. Also, remember to subscribe to our podcast. We've got Follow the Money, which is available on iTunes, Mine, Dollars and Cents, uh, where I kind of sort of predicted a we might be going near a recession, and then the unemployment figures came out today, and I went, well, <laughs> it's just stuffed. Well done. Don't predict things. This is the... <laughs> But anyway, thank you very much for all attending. As I say, back of the room is the book, and we'll see you all again thank next you, month. Thank Thanks, you, Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. We love that we can make these videos free to watch, but they're not free to make. It's thanks to our generous supporters that we can keep making research and content that changes minds. So, if you like what we do, please consider giving to the Australia Institute so we can keep doing it. Visit our website australiainstitute.org.au and click the donate button to see how your support can help fund high quality research that matters.